welcome back and um, it's a pleasure and the honor for me to be here with you today to um, introduce you the topic of um, the value and the power of emotions and emotional intelligence in learning and in design teaching. Um, I focused on learning and design teaching because uh, emotional intelligence is such a vast topic and to make it more relevant to you, I specifically wanted to talk about the role of emotions in teaching and learning. Um, and when I was preparing, I looked at the booklet and uh, I was reading your bios and, uh, what, you, and what you said uh, that you want to change about and bring to the design teaching um, I felt there was a good connection, a very strong connection with emotional intelligence. And this is what you have said. By the way, I collected some key sentences. Instill the art of curiosity, embrace mentorship, strengthen in intrinsically motivated exploration, encourage critical thinking, create space for personal development, strengthen interdisciplinary exchange and collaboration, give freedom for personal creative development, teach in teams and co-design, create freedom for experimental processes, connect design education to personal growth, to personal connection, create with a very intuitive and curious attitude, create a safe space, equip students with ethical compass, drive innovation, meet each other respectfully, communicate and act as a bridge builder in society. So, I felt there was a strong connection with emotional intelligence, so I hope that during this practical workshop and the time that we will have together, I'm able to sparkle your interest and your enthusiasm in learning more and practicing uh, emotional intelligence in your daily life and especially with your students in the classrooms. Um, so I would like now just to start with, um, an, a, by the way, it will be an interactive workshop, so I will uh, talk a bit and then ask you questions. Some, some of the questions will be reflective questions, some of the questions will be where you will have to do an exercise or share in a plenary. So let's watch this uh, short, funny video, and uh, it's about um, a classroom. And uh, what, while you watch it, I'd like you to think of what are the risks and consequences of not understanding emotions and also of not being aware of the impact that our behavior can have on other people and also our emotions can have on other people. Hey, I just wanted to see how your class was going. Where is everybody? There is no class. Did you send everyone to the principal's office already? <laughs> no one signed up. Well, that's not your fault. I called the department secretary to see what happened. Apparently, I have a reputation for being obnoxious. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, Sheldon, I'm sorry. No. It's fine. Now I can devote all my time to dark matter. Oh, you bought cookies for everyone? Oh, yes. Fig Newtons. I was going to ask them which scientist both helped to develop calculus and had a famous cookie named after him. And then after someone said Newton, I was going to tell them they're wrong. <laughs> the cookies are named after a town in Massachusetts. <laughs> and then I'd throw the cookies away. <laughs> hey. What if I took your class? Why would you do that? Yeah, yeah why would you wrong do with you? <laughs> Thinking about getting my doctorate? And he wants to teach? Why not? No, oh, Howard, but I appreciate the gesture, but this is a graduate level physics class. <laughs> I don't think you'd understand a single thing I was talking about. Ask why not again, I've got an answer. <laughs> Sheldon, I'm more than smart enough to take your class. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. 
How would you determine the ground state of a quantum system with no exact solution? I would guess a wave function and then vary its parameters until I found the lowest energy solution. Hmm. <laughs> Do you know how to integrate x squared times e to the minus x without looking it up? I'd use Feynman's trick, differentiate under the integral sign. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the correct interpretation of quantum mechanics? Since every interpretation gives exactly the same answer to every measurement, they are all equally correct. However, I know you believe in the many worlds interpretation, so I'll say that. Now, do you think I'm smart enough? No. <laughs> school for a couple more years than me, but guess what? Engineers are just as smart as physicists. <gasps> you take that back. <laughs> no. Okay. So, so what are the risks and the consequences of not being aware of how we feel and what is the impact on of our behavior and our emotions on other people. Any immediate reaction, <laughs> any ideas you have on this? Misunderstanding. Misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Intimidation. Intimidation. Uh -huh. You can create a sort of uh, um, yeah, intimidation. Empty classrooms. Empty classrooms, that, that's the consequence, <laughs> yes, as a teacher. Breaks the communication, either what? Intimidation, so the communication doesn't start yeah. from the mm -hmm. And what is missing for Sheldon? Emotional intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Empathy. Empathy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Humility. Yeah. Okay. So, just an introduction to this, um, the importance of the self-awareness. And sometimes we are not aware and sometimes uh, we don't, we underestimate how the impact that we can have on other people. Um, so learning itself is an intrinsically emotional uh, business, as Dr. Claxton said, and he was a, a, co a UK cognitive specialist, uh, scientist, and also an education uh, leader, famous for the learning uh, power approach. So it, learning is social, and it's about the relationship between the student and the teacher, and between students and themselves. And this is where emotional intelligence comes into play. So whether you want it or not, as teachers, you are bound to have an effect by accident or design on how your learners feel during a session and also in influencing their learning state. And why? Because we are social creatures, human beings, we are social creatures, and also because emotions spread quickly, they are contagious, they spread quickly and they uh, mostly unconsciously. So we can have an effect on each other. So self-awareness is key, and this self-awareness is the first step of being emotionally intelligent. I'd like to start with a short activity, and I'd like you to think of a teacher, a mentor, a coach, or a boss, someone who either multiplied or diminished your motivation. And while you think of that person, you can take some notes and reflect on what were they saying or doing, how did they make you feel, and what was one of your deepest learning experiences and why. So I'll give you um, five minutes and then we will share in plenary. And while we do that, I'll play some music. Any 
anyone would like to share what came up when you were thinking of that person? And maybe focusing on what type of emotions did you experience with in this classroom with this teacher or a mentor or coach? Anyone would like to share? Yes? Okay, so my experience was when I was like 12 or 13 years old. Um, I had a teacher and I think I did not do my homework. I told her and at that point of time she said something which was like really profound and wise. I was not able to understand it much at that point of time but later on when I reflected upon it, it was like mind-blowing for me. So uh, she told me like when you like someone, you tend to overlook their weaknesses and try to highlight their strengths. Mm -hmm. And she gave me an example of like an Indian uh, mythological story in which it was about Ramayana, if anyone has heard of it. Um, so we have a god sort of person, Ram, but uh, he left his wife in the jungle uh, because he thought she was impure. But throughout the narration of the Ramayana, no one talks about it and everyone tries to like glorify how good he was and how obedient and everything. Mm -hmm. So she told me in the, uh, like she told the lesson in form of the story. But later on when I grew up, I reflected upon it and I was like, okay, there were two lessons which I learned from it. The first one was when you like someone, you highlight their strength and it makes them feel empowered. Secondly, it was the thing which made me realize that how narrations work and they are never neutral. Most of the time they're biased uh, from the someone who is telling them. So yeah, those were the two lessons. Okay, good. There's a good connection with what we were doing on strengths <laughs> just earlier on. Thank you. So focusing on your strengths. Thank you. Anyone else? I can say something. Xavier. Actually, I have two people. One was my first design professor in my first year at the, in my degree when I studied architecture. And the second one is the last one. And they, they were the ones that motivated me the most, but in very opposite uh, directions. Mm -hmm. The first one motivated me in terms of, like, she showed me that I could, that I was good at what I was doing, and she gave me trust. Whereas the other one challenged me, questioned me, and told me that I was not good enough. <laughs> Literally. And so both of them motivated me a lot to work. Mm -hmm whereas the one was very encouraging, the other one was sort of even traumatizing. Uh, because one uh, made me, so I learned with the one to feel passionate about something, to also somehow to realize that I, that I like what I was doing and there was mm -hmm. some sort of something that came from within. Whereas the other one, or the good, the good outcome I would say from the second one, that I of course after a lot of process, is that uh, I don't have to feel myself, I should not feel uh, influenced that much by others' opinions, okay. which in the end it's also a feeling self-satisfaction. In the end you have to be happy with what you're doing, mm -hmm. no matter what the other ones are saying. Okay, so they motivated you in two di very different ways. And I pick the word trust because it's something that is very important to have as an emotion in the classroom. Thank you. Anyone else has an example that really impacted you? Rene. <laughs> ah. I'll share one thing quickly about a mathematics teacher that I had um, in high school. And I tried to think about why she actually motivated me to do my best. And she was just being herself. Um, and that actually gave me the freedom to be myself rather than giving a set of false expectations mm -hmm. or a, a false, uh, this is what school should look like. So okay. she actually gave me the freedom to be myself by being herself. And I think she got a lot out of a lot of students just by being herself. 
Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. This is a very good example of role model. So she encouraged you to be yourself by being herself in the first place. Thank you very much. Keep in mind that, uh, teacher, while we go through the workshop, because there are some connections with motivation and emotions that, um, that you can feel and you can also instill in your students. So, just what is emotional intelligence? So, um, it's a vast field and uh, um, I would like to refer to a specific uh, um, definition and also a model that I am familiar with. Um, and the two psychologists, uh, Jack Meyer, um, who was a professor at the University of New Hampshire, and Peter Solovey, uh, also a dean and professor of psychology at Yale University, first coined the term emotional intelligence in 1990 and later on uh, came up with this definition. Uh, the ability to perceive and express an emotion, assimilate an emotion in thought, understand and reason with an emotion, and regulate in the self and others. So you can see here in the definition there is this thinking and feeling aspect, but also the individual and the social dimension of emotional intelligence. So in um, simpler words, we can say that emotional intelligence is the capacity to blend thinking and feeling to make optimal decisions. And what is the purpose? The purpose is to become more effective in the relationships with ourselves and with others. And emotions are just um, neuro, neuro hormones and chemicals which are released in the body. They are primarily um, produced in the brain, but also elsewhere in the system. And their function is to guide us to survive and thrive and to focus our attention and to motivate us towards a specific course of action. But in the era of artificial intelligence, and yesterday we were mentioning ChatGPT a lot, what is the value of um, emotional intelligence? And also how can humans stay ahead of artificial intelligence if it's even possible? So I asked ChatGPT, which is considered <laughs> the, collective <laughs> the collective intellect, and, um, and uh, this is the answer that, uh, that they, it was given. So as an AI language, we can read it together. I can tell you that it's unlikely for humans to stay ahead of artificial intelligence in all areas, given the incredible progress that we have made in recent years. However, there are several things that humans can do to maintain their competitive edge. Develop critical thinking skills, embrace creativity, learn new skills, and focus on emotional intelligence. And ChatGPT also said, that uh, um, artificial intelligence lacks the emotional intelligence that humans possess, and this can be a valuable skill to leverage. And humans can focus on developing their empathy, communication, leadership skills to work more effectively. And I also asked artificial intelligence, ChatGPT, what's the role of emotional intelligence in design teaching? And it came up with this emotional intelligence plays a crucial role in design teaching for these various reasons, understanding users' needs and preferences, creating empathetic designs, anticipate user reactions, feedback interpretation, team collaboration, adapting to changing trends and needs, resolving design conflicts, building trust and credibility. So, it's promising, <laughs> given the fact that artificial intelligence is so much present in our uh, everyday life. But thinking also about your role as a design teachers, uh, I, um, I was reflecting, and in fact, you are already using your emotional intelligence because you are, as design teachers, you are contributing to create beauty in the world, and beauty stirs emotions. 
So you are already indirectly really working with your artificial intel with, with your emotional intelligence to have uh, an impact in the world because in the end we want to bring quality uh, and value through what we are doing. So um, I'd like now to introduce you to a very practical model that we are going to practice uh, on emotional intelligence. And this is a, a practical and simple way to learn and to practice emotional intelligence. It, uh, it was developed in 1997 by Six Seconds, which is the, uh, the largest uh, international non-profit organization fully devoted to research, teaching, and spreading emotional intelligence in the world. They came up with this uh, actionable, actionable uh, model of um, emotional intelligence, which is now practiced by hundreds of thousands of individuals, businesses, uh, uh, schools uh, throughout the world. And this is the model, as I said, that I'd like to share and practice with you today. And the workshop will be like a, a journey with three milestones. So the first one is know yourself. Uh, the second one is choose yourself, and the third one is give yourself, which are the three pursuits of our emotional intelligence competency model. What does it mean? So know yourself is uh, the emotional intelligence ability to know what we are feeling, what kind of emotions we are experiencing, and what are our usual patterns of behavior. Choose yourself is the emotional intelligence ability to decide what course of action we want to take and uh, based on how we feel in order to avoid to be in autopilot and reacting just automatically to any type of um, events that, that happens. And give yourself is uh, the emotional intelligence ability uh, to decide what course of action we want to take um, based on our vision and mission. So it's really the give yourself is uh, um, how we want to impact the world um, and to have really um, a sense of purpose in everything that we do. Um, each one of these three pursuits have a series of emotional intelligence competencies which we will see together. But before exploring the first pursuit, I'd like to, um, to read you a poem. Um, this poem is, um, was written in the 13th century by Rumi. Rumi uh, was a mystic, a, a theologian, uh, and a poet. And it's quite uh, curious to know that what he said in the 13th century is still valid today. And why did I choose this poem is because uh, um, he talks about uh, the value of welcoming our emotions and he talks about emotions like guests in our house. And this has uh, to do a lot with uh, the first pursuit of our emotional intelligence model, which is know yourself. It's part of knowing yourself. So the poem says, this being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all even if they are a crowd of sorrows who viol violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. So this gives us really the focus on how important it is to be aware of our guests in our house and to welcome them. So, and this is really about the first 
um, pursuit of our emotional intelligence model, Know Yourself, which is about recognizing um, and being aware of how we feel, noticing our reactions, becoming more self-aware, tuning in, and paying close attention to what's happening inside us. And in this uh, pursuit, we have two emotional intelligence uh, competencies. And by the way, I have shared with you the model um, on a page. You have also the definitions of each of the competencies. So the first one is called enhanced emotional literacy, which means to accurately identifying and interpreting both simple, simple and compound feelings. So if we look at, if we make an example of a situation in your classroom um, and you feel maybe frustrated because of your students, you are not, because your students may, maybe they are not as engaged as you may uh, want, how does that emotion, that frustration, affect your thinking and also your way of reacting? And how does it motivate you to stop or do something else? And is this, if this frustration was uh, an email to you, from you to you, what would be the message of that email? The second competency is recognize patterns. And we all follow patterns of behaviors, things that we are normally do when we react to a situation. And so if we use the same situation again of, of feeling frustrated with your classroom, can you recognize what triggered that emotion? What is the pattern? And how do you usually react to that pattern, how do you usually behave in that situation, um, what that frustration might push you to do, perhaps withdraw from your students or get angry and maybe have a more proactive approach or get loud or uh, get quiet. And does that reaction serve you, serve your purpose? Mm. And also is about the past. Can you recognize any patterns where you behaved in the same way? And, and how did, did it work in the past? So these are two emotional intelligence competencies related to being more self-aware. It's more about yourself, how you feel and how you react. So we are talking about recognizing emotions um, inside you first and then also in the relationships with others. I have now a short, very short activity which is um, an abstract from uh, a cartoon, Inside Out. It's a cartoon but there is solid uh, theory behind it. And while you watch this abstract, just think how do I usually recognize emotions? And then we can have an exchange. Very nice. Okay, looks like you got this. Very good. Oh, that's right, parent. Oh, look out! That's fear. He's really good at keeping Riley safe. Easy, easy, huh? Hi, back! Oh, we're good. We're good. Ooh, Thank you. Good Thank job. you very much. And we're back. <laughs> Go. All right, open. So that is not brightly colored or shaped like a dinosaur. Hold on, guys. It's broccoli! Yes! Well, I just saved our lives. Mm. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, sure! We'll eat our dinner right after you eat this! Ah! Right, ah! right, here comes an airplane. Ah! Oh, oh, airplane. No. We got an airplane, everybody. Oh. Oh. I'm not actually sure what she does. And I've checked, there's no place for her to go, so she's good, we're good, it's all great. Anyway, these are Riley's memories, and they're mostly happy, you'll notice, not to brag. Okay, so each of these characters uh, had the role of an emotion, so we, could you, did you recognize what, which emotions were? were? We had... Uh, 
fear first, and uh, fear has the, um, the role of protecting us mm, from danger. Then w there was um, joy, sadness, uh, disgust, um, uh, and uh, yes, um, anger, the red one. So how do you usually recognize these emotions in others? What are the signs that you can detect? Face. Face. face, the face, the facial expressions. Voice. The voice. The, body gestures. the gestures, the body language. The body language. How they move and how they position themselves. Yes, how distant they position and how close they want to be, to be maybe. Mm -hmm. and what's being said? What's the words. And how it's been said. Maybe a change of behavior? Mm -hmm. A sudden change of behavior. Yeah. But sometimes I would say how somebody is doing something is angry. And then I realize when I ask them it's not angry. Okay, so that's it's because you want to find out more. And, yeah. and I think sometimes, yeah, I recognize the difference in how we express each mm -hmm. other. Yes. And yes? Yes, and also I think we are all trained, or many of us are trained from the to hide their emotions. So, um, other than here, where it's very explicit and you can read their faces, um, quite often I find it's, it's, it's much harder in real life to read someone's emotions. Maybe that yeah. that mm -hmm. corresponds um, because of this, um, there's a certain behavior to hide all emotions in others, especially in a, in a classroom. Yes, and, and it it is also related sometimes to our education, to our culture, the way that we have been trained. But usually, usually we all react when we feel strong emotions. So, and, the, the, and why do you think it's important to be able to detect those emotions? What is the value of doing that? I think it's what you said initially, that if, if you have an awareness of your emotion, you can regulate them. And I think there's a, there's a nuanced difference between hiding and regulating emotions. And hiding can, and suppressing them can be really counterproductive, but regulating them is actually very yes. necessary for us. Yes. To function them. And, and this is, in fact, an emotional intelligence ability that is related to how you regulate your emotions mm? because they are always there. Mm? And what is, how can we harness the power and the value and the energy of those emotions because they are energy, they are messages that we can use to become, to be more effective. So um, I'd like just to, um, to Give you, ask you a question and look into the more the neuroscience behind um, emotions. Um, and do you know what happens in the brain when we name our emotions or our, the emotion that we feel? Okay. So the research has found that just by naming and vocalizing the emotion that we are experiencing, it has an immediate effect on the brain in terms of quieting down the intensity of the emotion that we are experiencing. And this opens the door for us to become more intentional in our choices, in how we want to react uh, in that specific situation. And so we are more able to blend our thinking with our feeling in a more optimal way. So this is why there is a saying which says, name it, name the emotion to tame it. Hmm? Name, to tame, name it to tame it. So by just pausing 
and taking the time to recognize um, and verbalize those emotions, we are less likely to react um, and to also have an emotional hijack where the signals go directly to the amygdala, and this is represented in this picture. Um, so in normal times, when we um, perceive an event, let's say a threat or a danger, uh, the signal of that uh, perception goes to the rational part of the brain to be analyzed, to be um, translated, um, and to be, an yes, to be analyzed for interpretation and translation. But uh, uh, only, and only afterwards, the signal goes to the amygdala, the part of the brain which is responsible for reaction and for action. And the, the, um, the, um, the role of the amygdala is really to protect us from danger, from perceived danger. But when we are experiencing an intentional emotional event, um, a stress, that signal bypasses the cortex and goes directly into the amygdala. And this is what Daniel Goldman, one of the founding fathers of emotional intelligence, uh, defined as hijacking the amygdala because there is no intellectual thought and the brain is hijacked by the emotions, the intensity of the emotion. And uh, this is quite interesting to know because if we know that this could happen, then we can act on, on this and we could take some strategies to be more effective in our relationships. And how long do you think um, it takes for an emotion to be completely absorbed in the body? Do you have any idea? 30 minutes? 30 minutes? <laughs> no. Actually, it takes six seconds. So it has been scientifically demonstrated that from the time there is a, a burst of emotion chemicals um, and from the time this emotion is produced in the hypothalamus to the time it completely bro uh, breaks down in the body, it takes six seconds, about six seconds. So if we are feeling something longer than six seconds, we are at some level choosing to refuel and recreate that feeling. Mm -hmm. So we can say that we have this six seconds window of opportunity to understand what we are feeling, step back from that emotion, and make an intentional choice on how we want to react. Mm -hmm. So we can say that those six seconds are represent our space for freedom and choice. So I'd like to do a very short uh, activity. I'm going to distribute these uh, bio dots and you are, each one of you will take one and stick it on, the, um, on, the, on your hand and see what happens. Oops. So we said that uh, um, we are still in the first pursuit of our emotional intelligence model, know yourself. And we said that uh, emotions uh, are part of our physiology. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to check in on your current physiological state, and which is linked, by the way, to how you feel, the emotions that you feel. Um, I lost mine. Okay. Okay, so these biodots actually measure the skin temperature and which is linked, the skin temperature is linked to your stress level. So what, what in, in a few seconds you will have a color popping up. And that's the meaning of... Uh, 
of each color. So how, how are you feeling? <laughs> what color is? Engaged, green. Relaxed. <laughs> black is black. <laughs> Mine is <laughs> very tense. <laughs> okay, well, and now based on on how you feel inside. Let's do another activity. I'd like, uh, I'd like you to name an emotion that you are experiencing right now. Just name an emotion or two emotions if you feel more than one. Anyone would like? Curiosity. Cur cu curious, uh, curiosity. Mm -hmm. Interest Anyone else would like excitement? Mm -hmm. Excited? You feel excited? Curious? Interested? Who else? Surprised. Mm -hmm. Comfortable. Okay, so uh, we are still in this part of self-awareness, being aware of how you feel. And uh, in order to really know yourself well, uh, we saw how important it is to know exactly what emotion you are experiencing and how to be more aware. But in order to do that, you need also to have a good vocabulary, a good emotional vocabulary. And uh, the more words um, that we have for different complex feelings, the better we can understand and navigate our own feelings and achieve greater effectiveness. So I'd like to share this is a model. It's called the Pluchik wheel, and you have it also on your uh, chairs. I, I'll share it with you. It's a very good place uh, to test your emotional vocabulary and to start expanding it. So I had put the, the QR code because you could go, you can go online, and this is an interactive wheel. I was going to share with you, but we can't right now. Um, so Pluchik was uh, a scientist, and he, st he studied the physiological reactions of emotions in animals, but they are actually very relevant also for humans. And in this wheel, he represented the spectrum of mainly all the emotions that we can feel. And uh, there are eight basic emotions that you can see in the, in the center of the wheel, in the second circle of the wheel. So joy, trust, fear, surprise, sadness, disgust, anger, and anticipation. Um, and you see that there is also an intensity in the colors of each petal. And the more uh, the emotion is intense, the greater, the stronger the color is. So, for example, if we take uh, joy, which is one of the eight primary emotions, we have serenity, where there is less inten intensity, and then ecstasy. And I can... So, if you click on this interactive wheel, if you click on joy, for example, it gives you the meaning of, of, the, of that emotion, um, sense of energy, possibility, these are the sensations, and what is joy telling you, that life is going well, that you are safe, that you can go on with this uh, situation because it's a positive one for you. And then you can play again with the buttons, the plus or the minus, and, um, and it gives you also the definition of the other emotions. 
and uh, in between the, the petals you have uh, the white space. These are other secondary emotions that are the result of two emotions. So if we take, for example, love, up on the right is considered to be the, uh, the mixture uh, of joy and, uh, and trust. And I'd like to focus a bit on trust because I think it's a key and relevant emotion to have and to develop in the classroom with your students. Um, and we said that uh, um, just by naming how we are feeling, the emotions that we are feeling, uh, reduces the intensity of that emotion, particularly if it is an unpleasant emotion. And it's been also demonstrated that by naming and validating uh, the emotions that somebody else is feeling also increases, increases the trust and the connection with that uh, person. So by just saying, you seem upset, uh, or you, sh you, you, see, you, you looked frustrated. So acknowledging the emotions that the other person is feeling is a way to get more closer and to create this interpersonal connection and trust. And remember also that emotions are data and they are messages from you to you. And sometimes we experience more than one emotion at the same time, and that can be quite confusing. Mm? So um, there are different layers, uh, um, and, and we can, uh, for example, feel very nostalgic about something, and nostalgia is a, a, a mixture of different emotions. Um, we have joy for something that happened that was great, but also we have a bit of sadness and maybe trust because you felt well in that situation. So um, by using this tool, uh, you can be more effective in understanding not just your own emotions, but also the emotions of maybe your students and people around you. This was another example. Okay, so we move into responding to emotions, which is the second pursuit of our model and the second uh, milestone of our uh, journey in the, uh, in the workshop. So choose yourself is, as we said, the emotional intelligence ability to choose how we want to react to a certain situation. And there are different uh, um, emotional intelligence competencies linked to this. Um, so, for example, the first one is apply consequential thinking, which means to evaluate the cost and the benefits of your choices. So, for example, if we go back to the same situation of you feeling maybe frustrated in your classroom, apply consequential thinking would mean um, to be able to... Um, understand what are the consequences of your different type of reactions, what are the costs and benefits of maybe not addressing your students being disengaged. What would be the consequence if you react to that or if you do, if you do not react to that situation? Uh, we also have another competency, navigate emotions, and this is what uh, Annette was saying, regulating, being able to understand how we want to uh, react in a certain situation, what type of action we want to, um, to, to do. Um, so again, if we go back to the same situation of feeling frustrated, how can you maybe use also the energy of that frustration, maybe to change your course of action and to do something different, maybe you need to change your approach, maybe you need to um, do an exercise or um, uh, say something differently so that you can use your frustration to create a different um, interpersonal exchange with your students. Mm? So navigate emotion is also being able to use the energy of that feeling to do something that is more effective. 
And then we have engage intrinsic motivation, which is uh, uh, infusing uh, passion um, into what you are doing. So what is the motivation that drives you to behave in a certain way? Mm? And this has to do with your values, with, with what is important to you, your commitments, um, and in, instead of being driven by some external forces. Mm? And the last one is exercise optimism. And we say exercise because it requires work, effort. Mm? And this is connecting your daily choices with your overarching sense of purpose. So as design teachers, what is the purpose of your work? How can your passion for design and for teaching infuse your actions and motivate your students um, uh, to engage and, and to learn. Okay, so this was the second, uh, our second model. Um, and um, just sharing with you some um, quotes uh, on learning, which is learning is state dependent. So when we are in a resourceful state, uh, we are more prone to give our best. And the resourceful state affects all the, the physiological processes of the brain so that learning becomes more effective and more likely. Um, so I'd like to have a bit of an exchange where maybe you share your best practices or what you are already doing that is uh, um, effective in encouraging this uh, psychological state or this emotional state that is conducive to learning. And, um, and we know that uh, um, so an emotional environment that is conducive to learning is where people feel safe, for example. And one way of making people feel safe is building trust and connection. So how can you um, create such an environment uh, um, in which your students feel safe rather than threatened and challenged, yes, but not pressured and motivated rather than disengaged and curious um, rather than indifferent. So I'd like to have a, an exchange where you can maybe share your experiences and also from the past or from other teachers um, that can be also of value to each other. Any ideas of things that you already do that are working well? How, how do you build trust? How do you connect deeply with, with your students? What are you doing that is already working? For example, I uh, oftentimes use a circle of chairs. Circle uh, of? Chair, of chairs. Chair, chairs. Uh, no desks. Um, so, and oftentimes I hear from students that this was the first time they saw each other while they were talking, answering, working, doing something. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing I do is uh, uh, I try to avoid um, judgment. And how do you do that? Um, I ask questions. Okay. <laughs> asking, asking questions and, and getting their input. And try to engage them to discuss. Mm -hmm. yeah. engage, engage them to discuss, ask questions, ask open questions is a, an excellent way to engage people. Um, what else? In, in, in addition to, to don't judge, uh, I try to, to get in a neutral position. I, mm. I, I avoid uh, yes, judging or, or negative statements. I try to go into a, a neutral position. Mm -hmm. and uh, So I try less to be an, a teacher, more like a, a, a guy who, who moderates the situation and 
look for connections and not for uh, disruptive or, or, or borders. So mm -hmm. that's, that's I try to also a bridge to, to trustment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Something I also try is to share my personal experience. So take it personally. So I show like examples of my work and mm -hmm. I criti or I criticize my own work and show the things that I, I'm proud of, the things that I'm not proud of and the mistakes I've made. Also to showcase that it's not always, yeah, that we all make mistakes and it's fine. But mm -hmm. so to address things from a personal perspective so that they also feel, so if I share my personal experience, they also can feel uh, confident to, to, sh to share theirs. Okay, so encouraging yourself to share and then share, sharing, have others share at the same time and be at their level. Exactly, mm -hmm. yes. Not judging, uh, asking open questions. Um, I said explicit agreements at the beginning of each class and then I repeat them and have students co-create those agreements. So <clears throat> there are things like, take space, make space. Like, mm -hmm. remember, when, if you tend not to speak up, then do that. And by doing that, there's language from the start about the behaviors that I'm wanting to uh, see in the classroom. And then I see students or anybody who I use that with using the same language okay. to, then, to then repeat that back to each other. Like, you can take some space, or maybe you want to make some space. <laughs> like, that, that can be a little in a moment that can be easier to come mm -hmm. back to language that we've already agreed on rather than it's an emotional thing, right? When you feel like, oh, that guy's been talking for an hour again, <laughs> then you have that language to say, could you please make some space? And that can diffuse situations. That's been mm -hmm. useful. So having a sort of ground rules of what is acceptable and how you want to work together. Mm -hmm. um, if yes. I'm starting a project, I'm, oh sorry, yeah. I often give give a lot of examples. Mm -hmm. Examples uh, I show them and I, I give, hand them to the to the students so mm -hmm. that they have a haptical experience uh, at once. So uh, in this way, they are emotionally involved in in the topic. Yeah, practicing and with examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe in addition, I want the students to become critical thinkers. So I'm always saying at the end, what is your opinion about a question, about a field, and uh, how do you want to become a responsible person mm -hmm. in future? And of course, there are different uh, ways also to, to answer, but then there is also nice discussions always. Yeah. Okay, it's through discussions. Mm -hmm. I had a teacher who studied each class with a quick check-in of everyone's emotions, and I found that really helpful to level the playing field and to really see what everyone's feeling. It was a remote class, so it was even more important because everyone just saw uh, black holes <laughs> to uh, catch up on each other and okay. just arrive together in this common space. Nice. So some emotional check-ins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, may I ask you, if that's, are they open enough to... Uh... Most of them, yes. Sometimes he picked up um, on a headline or something that happened in the world, just to say something like, the world's a fucking mess right now, let's talk about this quickly and then get on with it and have our class. Just to have this um, common space and create this kind of safe space for everyone to share the emotion towards something. Mm. Okay. Anyone else has a tip or a, like something that really works that you are doing that is really work? Yes. Um, I'm not teaching, but in everyday situations, I feel like when you try to explain something with force, it doesn't work. And there's a lot of discussions where people try to explain and then force it. And I feel like that doesn't work. 
But what I realize what works is when we can all really connect to the discussion like mm -hmm. on an emotional level and forget about the things we have like there, like all the arguments we would have and be more, maybe more honest and maybe more like, yeah, not explain, but discover together. Okay. Yeah. I, I realize explanations don't work a lot of times. And how are you doing that? I mean, at the beginning of a lesson or when you feel that there is a moment for them to share? How? Um, it's more workshops. Okay. And then like we did today in the morning, more like associations, mm -hmm. going deeper, not explaining, but like trying to connect to what everybody really means and what they want to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, thank you. Good. So you, you yeah, there is, is there somebody else who wants? No. So it seems you are already practicing some of these um, tools um, and it's just fine-tuning maybe with some um, ideas that are coming also from others. So I encourage you also to share um, during this time together. And now we come to the last pursuit of our emotional intelligence model, which is uh, um, give yourself. And here we have an activity that I'd like to do with you related to your sense of purpose in teaching. There are two um, key competencies. One is increasing empathy. Empathy is one of the emotional intelligence key competencies. And why um, is related to this third pursuit is because uh, now we are giving towards ourselves towards the world and towards others. So we started with noticing how we feel in the first step, then looking at how we react and then how we give to others. What is our noble purpose? How can we connect better, better to others and to the world? Um, so again, for the, if you look at the definition of the competency increase, empathy is really recognizing and appropriately responding to others' emotions. Um, and here, I think you have already shared some of your um, ideas on how to connect better with, with your students. Um, so sometimes it's uh, is good to remember that um, that trust, um, the way to, you, you can increase trust is really to connect and to ask open questions. And sometimes uh, we don't understand, we don't know what else is going on inside that person. So ju by just connecting, you can create a sort of um, deeper understanding. Uh, and this is about empathy and you can do it by just listening sometimes. And uh, pursue noble goals is the last emotional intelligence competency of this, uh, of the model. And uh, it's about the legacy that we want to leave as teachers and in general as individuals to the world. So the question that could be for you is what do you want to add to the world and how can you just do that a little bit each day? So maybe you have, you have examples of situations where you have been at your best and what enabled you to be at your best. So I'd like to do... Um, so we are social beings as I already said, wired by mirror um, neurons. And it's been demonstrated that uh, what we learn comes through what we observe in action uh, and then we imitate. So um, we are all role models and you are role models for your students. So what I'd like to do now is an activity and uh, you can uh, actually move and go to the different tables. And uh, during this activity, I'd like you to imagine that you are in front of a group of learners wearing a T-shirt. And this T-shirt carries a message that tells the group what, are you are, what you are going to do for them. 
So just you take a moment to consider what that message would be. And while you reflect, try to think of what is your noble goal and, uh, uh, in teaching. How does that goal contribute to an emotional environment that is conducive to learning? And how do you want your message to make your learners feel? So um, what I'd like is that you, um, you move and you maybe come up with a, a drawing or with an image or um, some words even that represent this T-shirt. And the T-shirt is the message that you want to convey. So we can have maybe about um, eight minutes to do that. We have some time. Um, so there are colored pens and uh, papers on the three tables. So you can move there and, um, and get inspired to write your message. What I suggest, what I suggest is that um, we, you will stick your T-shirts on the wall over there with this sticky um, uh, material that is on the table, so that when during the day you can look at each other's T-shirts and maybe get inspired or just motivated. Uh, and, and give this energy and of this um, noble goal, of your noble goal in, in teaching, um, inspiring others. So anyone would like to share what is on their T-shirt, the message? Just, you know, I know you have shared in the tables, but not everyone has heard it. Who wants okay, to start go again. First? Rene. <laughs> you might even like it. <laughs> and this is not my message. It's the message of my uh, rowing trainer. Uh, this is how I started rowing. He said, mm, uh, he told his story. Uh, his grandparents told him, mm, try this food. Even if you haven't seen it before you might even like it. And this is how he came to, and then started playing music. He didn't like it, but then he started one time, he started rowing, and he sticked. And after finally, he became rowing um, world championship. So, you might even like it. You might even be good at it. Yeah, mine's is, glaube ich, relativ selbsterklärend. Let's talk. Um, uh, we're doing it in English, right? <laughs> um, because I think that's the core of everything is the discussion and the um, exchange. But I also, I had two others which are actually the same except for one word. Uh, that's what actually the first thought I had was um, you'll find out why you're here because at some point you just end up being there and mm -hmm. maybe you'll never really find out why but that might be a good thing to start at, to search for the why. So the first was, you'll find out why you're here, and the other one was then, you'll understand why you're here. Because mm -hmm. maybe that's a fine nuance and difference. So nice. yeah, that's the three. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Yes. Um, I think it's necessary uh, to show how it, the effect if you, if you wear it. Yeah. Um, and I think this would be the first thing I would start with. Um, and another thing, which is the same somehow, would be this, uh, wearing it as a woman <laughs> and a teacher, and it is funny as well. So uh, humor could be something Humor. interesting mm -hmm. to... Uh, 
to use to get into mm -hmm. a into a good into a good feeling together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so we are reaching the end. Is there anyone else? Any? Yes. So mine is. Um, I'll just show it. It's a little bit more cryptic. Um, but it's basically things may happen here. Things can do whatever you want to be them. So creating the space for others. So you can then put them up on that wall and so, so that everyone can, can see them. So we are reaching the end of um, this time together and I'd like to end with an ins inspirational video and it's about Mr. Jensen and uh, it, it makes a good connection with what we saw this morning about strengths and tapping into the strengths of our students. And this can, can happen if you are really tuning in with them, if you, if you understand what are their strengths and, and encourage them to use their strengths. And in doing that, they are themselves uh, contributing to living their noble goal, mm? the noble goal. You can be an inspiration for them to really use their strengths as uh, uh, their really their power and, and the way to engage with the world. So you can be inspirational for them to be inspirational. So let's watch it together. I have a lot of memories from when I was a child. One that's always stuck out to me though was when I was about 10 years old and I was in school and I struggled. And I, I didn't struggle with English, math, or science. I struggled holding still. And I would try to listen and focus and process ideas, but I couldn't help myself. And to be honest, I would sit there and then I would just start tapping. And the students in the class would look at me and they'd say, hey, stop tapping. A lot of the time, I didn't even realize I was doing it. And then eventually even the teachers got after me and they would yell at me and they'd say, Clint, you have to stop tapping. It got so bad that I got sent to the principal's office for tapping. And he said to me, Okay, maybe when you go back to class, just try sitting on your hands. And so I did. I went back to class, and when I felt myself starting to tap, I just, I did this. I sat on my hands. And that worked for about five seconds. One time I was tapping in class, and my teacher, Mr. Jensen, he looked at me, and he yelled. And he said, Clint, stay after class. And I thought to myself, this is it. I am done. Now, I've always been the type of person that believes that a single moment in time can change a person's life. And this was one of those moments for me, and I will never forget it. And so I was sitting there with Mr. Jensen and an empty classroom. And he walked past me and he sat next to his desk and he said, Clint, come here, I wanna to talk to you. And as he looked me right in the eye, he said, now I need you to know something, you're not in trouble, but I do have just one question that I have to ask you. And he asked, he said, have you ever thought about playing the drums? And in that moment, Mr. Jensen, he leaned back and he opened the top drawer of his desk. And he reached in and he pulled out my very first pair of drumsticks. And he held them in his hands and he looked at me and he said, hey Clint, you're not a problem. I think you're a drummer. drums all over the world. My whole college education was paid for with drum space in my hand. Just because of a single moment in time when somebody believed in me and he saw something in me that I didn't even see within myself. And from that moment, I learned that there's a difference between being the best in the world and being the best for the world. And my last question to you is, what's one step that you will take 
as a result of this workshop. One little step. We saw it, it's a journey, emotional intelligence, and um, it starts with a small step. Any of you would like to share their first step? Yes. Well, I, I really uh, liked the, the Rumi poem mm. where the negative emotions are, are worth to be accepted. And this is something I, I... Well, now I can imagine what to do with it. Often I don't know what to do with it. We talk a lot about yeah. positive emotions. But there are negative emotions and they do a lot of harm if I cannot accept them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I try to in integrate them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for saying that because one of the things I didn't say is that when we talk about emotions, we don't distinguish between positive or negative. We just welcome them all. And also the negative, what we say negative, is more like unpleasant to yes. feel. They have a message to us. And we can use that message. So thank you for bringing this up. Yes, um, the same for me. I, I like the, the picture of the, the guest house, uh, that the teaching is not an, a task or something to, to do, and the, 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 ex, the, the result is important. So it's only an invitation. The invitation to my experience, an invitation to my world. And it's, it's a warm welcome to say, come in. And on the other hand, I, I will, will pay attention to your world and to your mm -hmm. expectation and your fear. And so we, we, we have a connection onto the same eye level. And that's an invitation. And the guest house is a wonderful picture of this. Yeah. Thank you. And as we said, it starts from us, as you said. Um, to build on that, I love that you said emotions are data because I'm gonna be teaching engineers starting next week and I'm a little bit terrified <laughs> because, you know, I lived in California for the last 10 years. I'm like, oh yeah, emotions, that's great. And then I'm gonna be standing in front of a class of 30 engineers and I think they'll look at me and they'll be like, who the heck are you? And so it just to have that language to be able to say, no, this is data. It's actually just as important as your spreadsheets are, but you do need to integrate that in your work. That's incredibly helpful, so thank you for that. Thank you. Sorry, this is not a step. I just wanted to add something because you're saying it. Because what we usually not, don't understand about emotional intelligence, we kind of think there are some people who are intelligent and there are people who are emotionally intelligent. And what works with teaching engineers, because I teach a lot of them, <laughs> is actually explaining to them that emotion, because all intelligences are correlated, emotional intelligence is highly correlated with IQ intelligence. Mm -hmm. And rather than them being the opposite of one another, Mm -hmm. And there are certain aspects of emotional intelligence, especially uh, depend, uh, related to understanding emotions, not necessarily emotional awareness so much, but understanding and managing emotions are specifically higher. You would actually find them high in people with higher IQ. And actually, so that enables the engineers to accept that this data <laughs> is actually useful because by knowing it, they can think better with it. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Great, <laughs> great trick. I loved your hijacking image. Okay, <laughs> thank you. You said sometimes hijacked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you for your engagement and um, good luck. And um, I will be sharing with you also some uh, tips and also some exercises uh, like uh, mindfulness moments that you can uh, have your, with your classroom before you start maybe a lecture if it's possible. Uh, or uh, listening circles where you, you practice empathy with each other in small groups. So this sort of practical uh, exercise that you can do in addition to the slides, of course, and the links to the model that I have shared with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.